Squeeze Residential Field Study. Our speakers today include David Cohen and Jeremy Williams from the Department of Energy and Vrishali Menden from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to our first speaker, David Cohen. David, take it away. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I am just astounded. We had almost 1,000 people sign up. There's already almost 500 on the line listening to this webinar, which is great. Um, I am the program manager for the Building Energy Codes program here at the Department of Energy. And it seems that interest in energy codes is growing and growing, um, as we see by the number of people on this call. But at the same time, there's been almost a complete lack of data on how much savings energy codes actually deliver. So usually when a state or a municipality adopts a new code, it's a relatively easy task to do a spreadsheet calculation that compares the energy that buildings will consume under the new code to what they would have consumed under the old code. And when you hear people saying things like, the new code is 5% or 8% or 10% better than the old code, that's what they're talking about. The problem with those percentages is that they don't account for how buildings are actually built, the compliance aspect as it's been known. Uh, just because the code changes doesn't mean that designers and builders change. So to know how much energy is really being saved, you have to go into the field and look at real buildings that are under construction. And even that won't tell you about energy unless you design your study around it. So the traditional metric of choice for energy code studies has been compliance. And we fully acknowledge that DOE was one of the main promoters of that approach several years ago. And when you do a study like that, you go out to a bunch of buildings with a checklist that has every code requirement on it. You determine the percentage of the items that comply with the code. You divide that by the number of <coughs> uh, requirements that people are compliant with. And you end up, I'm sorry, you, div <laughs> you divide the compliant items by the total number of items. And you end up with a compliance rate. And the good thing about this approach is it's intuitive, it's easy to implement, and it gives you a definitive answer afterwards. The problem is that people then assume that the compliance rate is the same thing as the energy savings rate. And this is definitively not the case, because from an energy perspective, not all code requirements are created equal. They range from incredibly important and impactful things like wall insulation and windows to zero energy impact for a labeling requirement. And that doesn't mean that labeling requirements don't have a value. It's just that they don't save energy directly. There have been a few, few previous studies in California and the Northwest uh, that have looked at energy, but they were still designed around compliance. The methodology we're going to talk about today was designed from the start around energy, and it provides the best data we have to date to understand how much of the energy savings potential from energy codes is actually being realized for single family new construction. And I want to make it clear when we start, everything we talk about today is only about single family new construction. Um, that is just a budget constraint. We wanted to start with one thing that we had enough money for, so we focused on single family. Um, if we could find out the savings potential, um, this is critical information for the Department of Energy, for states, and for utilities who are concerned about how much power will be needed in the future. So the study we're going to talk about today is actually part of a larger study, which has three phases. And it's up on your screen. There's a baseline field study, which is what we are going to talk about today. And then those are going to be followed up with education and training that will use the information of the baseline study. And then we'll do a follow-up study. So this is classic experimental design. There's a preliminary baseline check. Then there's a treatment period. And then you check and see if the treatment had any impact. The goal of the first phase is to develop and test an energy-based methodology for these energy code field studies. And that's what we're going to talk through. What 
that methodology allows us to do, again, I'm just going to read off the slide, is establish an energy use intensity of code regulated energy in single family homes in a state. It allows us to identify code requirements that have high savings potential and low compliance so that we can target them with education and training. And then that allows us to calculate the potential energy cost and emissions benefits from increased compliance with targeted requirements. The, um, so to implement this project, uh, we put out a funding opportunity announcement, typically called an RFP, in the spring of 2014. In the fall of 2015, we selected the contractors, and they represented the eight states that are shown in dark blue on your screen. Since then, two states in light blue, West Virginia and Michigan, have started projects which will also follow this methodology, and we believe Minnesota will be doing a similar project in the near future. Uh, it, it's fairly glaring that the states are all off to the east and southeast of the country. That was not an intent or requirement of DOE. Uh, the proposals were selected based solely on merit, and the best proposals we received were from the states shown on the map. So in this overall project, DOE has two goals. Uh, one, as I said, is to establish this methodology, but what we hope is that it will become the model methodology used all around the country for future studies. And then second um, is to establish a business case for private investment to increase energy code savings. This is critical, um, partly because DOE will never have the funding to do studies in all the states, let alone provide education and training in every jurisdiction in the country. The only way this is going to happen is if private organizations, particular utilities, provide funding. And the only way they're going to do that is if they have data that shows that this is a good investment by whatever criteria uh, they use, uh, be it return on investment or savings. There's lots of ways that utilities and utility regulators look at it. So ultimately, what we're hoping is that the methodology will deliver this data in a form that's useful to decision making on the part of private entities and that will start changing the amount of resources put in to increasing energy code compliant, compliance and that's why we believe this project is so important. Um, I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Jeremy Williams who works with me at the Building Energy Codes program here at DOE and he's going to explain the methodology we used in the study. Um, I know that the part that everybody actually wants to see is the results, and I promise you, you will see them. But it's important to go through the methodology thoroughly first so that you can understand the underpinnings, the strengths, and the weaknesses of the data that was collected. So again, thank you all for joining us, and Jeremy, you are on. Thanks, David. Hi there. I'm Jeremy Williams with the DOE Codes Program. I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall methodology for the study, uh, focusing mostly on how the study was designed. I'll start with an overview of how the sampling was developed and how the data was collected, and then we'll take a look at where the various state projects uh, currently stand. So let's start with some ground rules for the study. First off, the focus is on, as David mentioned, single-family new construction. We limited the study to one site visit per home, this was important for minimizing bias, and it means that you'll likely not be able to observe all the features of a home, only those which are installed and visible at the time that you're there on site. Also, an important point is that this yields insufficient data to determine, quote unquote, compliance for an individual home, something we'll get to more later. Code officials also have a limited role. Um, or I should say limited involvement, and they're not present for on-site data collection. They provide only a list of active projects and contact information, which is typically available through local building departments. Only pre-occupancy homes are visited, so no occupied or owner-occupied homes. This is for the purpose of maintaining confidentiality, which we identified as important early, uh, early in the study, and to avoid a direct impact on the uh, traditional enforcement process. So, only observed installed measures, no assumptions for what will be installed, only what is actually installed. And again, confidentiality, this is key. No personal or identifiable information is submitted. Uh, and again, to avoid direct influence. 
these are state studies, it's important to remember. So we are seeking a statewide data set. The findings that we come up with are only valid at the state level. And keep in mind the purpose here is not to determine compliance with individual homes, but rather to build this representative data set that can inform some of our later activities, the education training and outreach activities that David mentioned. So uh, lastly, although not directly required by, by several state codes, uh, states within the study, we did collect blower door and duct testing data on the homes. This information was necessary and that it has these things have a significant effect on home energy efficiency. So next we're going to talk a little bit about the sampling approach, how we conducted uh, sampling and determined which homes to visit. So a sampling plan was developed to assign uh, the required observations for each state. It was broken down uh, by local jurisdiction, most often by county. These plans were based on U.S. Census permit data whenever that data was available for a particular state and uh, focused on average housing starts over the past three years. It was a, or is a proportional random sample, meaning any home could be randomly chosen, any home under construction. But the overall sample should be representative of what, uh, or of current and expected, for that matter, uh, construction within the state. So the basic idea is that if 20% of the construction within a particular state is happening in a particular area, then about 20% of the sample should come from that area. After the initial plan was developed, uh, each plan was validated through kickoff meetings within each state. This gave uh, uh, stakeholders the opportunity to review each plan, provide input, identify any state-specific factors that might need to be considered as part of the study, you know, whether the underlying data was, um, was comprehensive and sufficient. The kickoff meetings typically involve the stakeholders I'm referring to are builders, code officials, state government agencies, uh, utilities, and really anyone else who wanted to participate. Ensuring Stakeholder buy-in was very critical. So the idea is that everyone can look at the plan and the end results and agree that the, repo, uh, the approach and therefore the end results are, are credible. After these plans were finalized, the uh, project teams began gathering uh, lists of projects from local building departments, started making contact, and then uh, began visiting homes until the sample plan was fulfilled. So the methodology and the sampling is driven by the code measures which have the largest direct impact on home energy efficiency. So Pete and L did some preliminary analysis to identify what these were. Here they are, as you see listed on the slide here, and they include envelope air tightness, so gathered through a typical blower door test and measured at ACH50, window U factor and solar heat gain coefficient, uh, wall insulation, just the metric there is R value, ceiling insulation, lighting, or the percentage of high efficiency lamps, foundation insulation, and duct leakage measured through a duct blaster test. So these are the key items that we'll refer to several times, and we'll take a look at you know, these primarily later in the results. But overall, pretty much exactly what you'd expect uh, to have a large impact on home energy efficiency. So some more on the sampling approach. Once the key items were identified, the question was then how many of each were needed in order to end up with an overall statistically representative study. So we started by estimating the expected distribution for each item or the variance of what you might expect to see in the field. And we expected certain items like air envelope air leakage to vary quite a bit or have a, a larger range, while other uh, items not so much. And in the end, we determined that we would need 63 observations of each key item. This is to enable the statewide sampling plan and the energy metric, uh, but also to detect statistic statistically significant differences between the pre-study and the eventual post-study. So one thing to note, requiring 63 observations of each key item means visiting more than 63 homes just because of the practical limitations of being able to observe everything you're looking for, all the code requirements, and get all the data during a single site visit. In terms of data collection, the teams used 
uh, a data collection form, essentially a checklist for each state and climate zone. And so while well, the key items are what drove the sampling and the eventual analysis, all the code requirements that could be observed were gathered during each site visit. And so some non-code requirements were also collected uh, for the purposes of verification and the analysis. So for example, uh, foundation type, HVAC systems, home size, lower door and duct leakage testing were performed wherever uh, it was possible. Insulation, installation quality was graded also for the analysis and then quality assurance, a number of quality assurance and control measures were taken during data collection and as part of the eventual handoff to PNML for the analysis phase. So here is a look at where the individual state projects currently stand. Each state in the respective lead organization is listed in the first two columns, followed by the code that is applicable within each state, so the base code. Many states in the study have had some version of the 2009 IECC, although Maryland has the uh, 2015 IECC, and North Carolina has a custom uh, state version. The number of homes visited for each state is also listed there, as well as what stage uh, each team is within the overall process. And at this point, most states have wrapped up their baseline data collection, and we are in the process of, of conducting the analysis. So that concludes our look at the methodology and current status. With that, I'd like to say thank you. And I'm going to pass the presentation off to Brushali at PNNL to give us a look at some of the results. Thank you, Jeremy. Hello, everyone. I'm Rushali Menden, and I'm a research engineer with the Building Energy Codes Program at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. So now that we have the background of the study and an idea of the methodology, let's look at some of the results. The next several slides describe the initial results package that will be created for every state under the analysis. Uh, we are presenting only a small amount of data that we have available, but our hope is that other organizations will use this data, which will be made publicly available, to conduct some of their own studies. So coming back to the initial results package, what it does contain is it contains a discussion of the key item observations that we collected from the field, the analysis, uh, the energy uh, use intensity analysis, and a calculation of the energy cost and emission reduction potential based on the EUI analysis. So today we are looking at the results for the state of Alabama. Alabama was chosen arbitrarily just to illustrate the package. Uh, but we do have uh, similar results already uh, um, uh, evaluated for uh, some of the other states as well. So let's begin with a distribution of the key item observations. First up, we have the envelope tightness. Now let's take a few minutes to understand what we are looking at because several of the uh, upcoming slides follow the same um, approach. There are two charts on this particular slide. This is because Alabama, this data is for Alabama, and Alabama has two climate zones, climate zone, two, climate zone 2A and climate zone 3A. The total number of observations for envelope tightness are indicated by the number uh, by N, shown on the top right-hand side of the slide. In this case, it is 65. And what that represents is the total number of envelope tightness observations for the entire state of Alabama. The x-axis shows the compliance metric. In, case, in this case, since we are looking at envelope tightness, the metric is uh, air changes per hour at 50 pascals. And as you know, a smaller number is better. So as you, as you have a lower ACH50 value, it actually means the house is tighter and doing better than what the code requires. The red vertical line is the code requirement effective in the state of Alabama. So in this case, this, it's the 2009 IECC requirement which is right about um, seven air changes at 50 pascals. Now, depending on what we are looking at, the homes that comply and or don't comply could lie to the left or to the right of the red vertical line. It's just the nature of the elements we are looking at, and I will point them out as we go through. So now looking at this slide, we see that there are, uh, there are four observations where we have two homes that have the same observed ACH50 value. The next slide illustrates this a little better. Next slide, please. So as you can see, there are four observations, four ACH observations where we have two homes uh, that, that, that have the same observed requirement. 
So what, what does this slide tell us is that for in most cases, the envelope tightness for the state of Alabama is actually better than what the code requires. Um, what the code requires. However, there are some cases that, as, as you can see, which are to the right of the red vertical line, which are doing a little worse. Now, the next slide, we look at um, the high efficacy lighting requirement. Again, the x-axis is the percentage of high efficient lamps observed in a given home during the data collection effort. We have a separate panel for climate zone 2A and climate zone 3A. The red vertical line is the 2009 IECC requirement, which is the same in this case across all climate zones. That's that 50% uh, high efficiency uh, lamps. And what we see is we have a wider spread here, especially in climate zone 3A, 3A where we have um, several homes uh, which have no high efficiency lamps at all, uh, indicated by the vertical bar against uh, the zero reading, whereas we have some homes that are almost at 100% uh, high efficiency lamps. So these are the kinds of trends that we are trying to see. Again, the total number of observations we have for high efficacy lamps is 71. So it's a reasonable um, number of um, observations. And these have been split into climate zone 2A and, and 3A. Next, we look at duct tightness. Similar to the uh, lamp, high efficiency lamp requirements, duct tightness, uh, the requirement um, in the 2009 IECC does not vary by climate zone. It is at 12 CFM uh, at 25 pascals pressure uh, per 100 square foot of conditioned floor area. Again, we see a wider spread. Uh, to, to reiterate, um, duct tightness, because this is duct tightness, a smaller value is better. So the values to the left of your red vertical line are actually better than code. The observations to the right are worse than code. And we see a whole, a whole lot of uh, observations are actually better than what the code requires. Then we look at ceiling R value. Um, because this is in the south, we have um, the same code requirement in the climate zone 2A and 3A for the 2009 IECC. That's R30. That's indicated by the red vertical line. The x-axis here shows the R value. And because this is the R value, a higher R value is better. So in this case, the observations to the right of your red vertical line are better than code. Um, and the observations to the left um, of the red vertical line are actually worse than what the code requires. Most, in most of the cases, um, it seems like um, ceiling, uh, the observed ceiling R values are right at the code requirement. There are a few uh, homes that we saw that had more than what the more uh, ceiling insulation than what the code required. But in some cases, we did see that um, the homes had less um, ceiling insulation than what was required of them. Then we move on to the frame wall, um, and this particular chart shows only the cavity insulation um, observations. It does not show the continuous um, um, wall insulation observations we have. We had a total number of 68 observations, again indicated by the end to the top right of the slide, a split between climate zone 2A and 3A. The code requirement for um, cavity wall insulation in the 2009 IECC in climate zone 2 and 3 is R13. And because this is R value that we are looking at on the x-axis, a higher value is better. So observations to the right of the red vertical line are better than code. Observations to the left are worse than code. And you see across the board, um, homes in Alabama are either meeting the frame cavity wall insulation requirement completely, and in some cases, some homes we saw had even more um, cavity wall insulation. So they were doing better than what the code required them to do. Then we move on to the window U factor. So the window U factor is, is one where um, the 2009 IECC has a different code requirement in climate zone 2A and a different one in climate zone 3A. The total number of observations that we have for window U factor for Alabama um, is 92, split between climate zone 2A and 3A again. <clears throat> the x-axis shows the window U factor. And the red vertical line shows the code requirement, that's the 2009 ICC requirement for each of these climate zones. Now, because we are looking at U factors, it's important to note that a smaller U factor is better. 
So in this case, the observations to the left of the red vertical line are actually better than code. And the observations to the right, well, that there aren't any in this case. But if there were any worse than code observations, they would show up to the right of the red line. Across the board, it seems like um, the windows um, are, are much better in Alabama than what um, the code requires them to be. We saw similar results for SHGC. Again, um, the x-axis shows the SHGC. Um, and in, in case of SHGC, a lower SHGC in the south is better. So the observations that fall at, I should step back. The red vertical line shows the uh, 2009 ICC code requirement. So because this is SHGC and a lower SHGC is better in the south, uh, the observations that lie to the left of the red vertical line are actually better than code, and the ones that lie to the right um, of the red vertical line are worse. And across the board, it seems like um, in Alabama, Windows have a better SAGC than what the code requires. Uh, there are some cases, especially in Climate Zone 3, where um, a slightly higher um, SAGC was observed in the field. Now, once we have all this key item data, we, we need to use it to carry out an EUI or an energy use intensity analysis. Now, like Jeremy mentioned earlier in the presentation, the data collection effort is based on a single site visit. And what happens because of the single site visit is that we don't have complete sets of key items for any given home observed in the field. We do have independent sets of at least 63 observations for each of the key items. Now, in order to build an energy model, and in our case, we used Energy Plus for our analysis, we need complete sets of key item observations. So we need to transition from these independent, incomplete sets of key item observations to complete sets that we can use in energy modeling. Uh, in order to do this, we use a Monte Carlo approach. And we randomly sample the data pool to generate 1,500 complete sets of key key item observations. Now, we chose 1,500 because looking at some of the data, we saw uh, we concluded that 1,500 was sufficiently high to cover the range of observations as, and at the same time balance our computational resources. Now, once we have our 15 sets of complete key item observation data, what we do is we take each of these sets and we build an energy model using DOE's residential building prototype. Using DOE's residential single-family prototype allows us to isolate the impact of codes from that uh, energy impact of codes from that of geometric or other aesthetic considerations. Now, this, this process of drawing 1,500 sets of complete key item observations and building uh, 1,500 energy models to go with that was completed in every climate zone in each state that was analyzed. Additionally, we also considered variations of foundation types and heating system types observed in the field. So in case of Alabama, where we have two climate zones, we ended up with two sets of 1,500 models. And say we had four heating system types that were observed in the field and four foundation types. So we would, this, this would give us a complete set of 48,000 um, building energy models. We also created models that met only the prescriptive code requirements of the code that was in effect in that state. And then, once we had our complete set of models, we simulated these models using Energy Plus and extracted the code-regulated energy use intensity. So energy use for heating, cooling, fans, lighting, and water heat. It's important to note that uh, this is simulated uh, energy use. It's not based on any actual energy consumption of these buildings. And then we compare the EUI results from the observed um, key item values to, the, to what the EUI would have been had the house been built to the prescriptive code requirements. Let's look at some results. This slide shows the results for Climate Zone 2A in the state of Alabama. So what this slide is, is it's the distribution of the simulated EUI from our EUI analysis. So it represents data for, for the set of 1,500 building energy models we have for, for Climate Zone 2A in Alabama. Now the x-axis shows the annual energy use intensity for the code-regulated end uses 
in kilo BTUs per square foot. Each of these vertical bars shows the portion of the building models from our 1500 set that falls in each of these EUI bins. So in other words, the sum of all these, um, all these vertical bars or the area under the curve is 100%. Once we have this distribution, <clears throat> we calculate the mean EUI based on the field data. And this is again simulated uh, EUI and which is shown by the purple line that you see on your screen, which is right at 18.01 kilo BTUs per square foot. We also have the prescriptive code EUI, meaning the simulated EUI of a building built to the prescriptive code requirements shown by the red vertical line. And in this case, it's at 20.58 kilo BTUs per square foot. What this tells us is that on average, uh, homes built in Climate Zone 2A in Alabama use less energy than what a home built to the prescriptive code requirement would consume. However, there are some homes shown here to the right of the red vertical line. Remember, this is EUI, so a lower EUI is better. So the worst homes are actually the homes that lie to the right of the red vertical line. These are the homes that have an EUI higher than the prescriptive code EUI. We see a similar trend in Climate Zone 3A. Again, we see most homes here, uh, this is based on the 1500 models built for Climate Zone 3A for Alabama. And we see that on average, most homes built, um, built in, the, in Climate Zone 3A in Alabama have a lower energy use intensity than what the prescriptive code requirement would result in, which is shown by the red vertical line. This is not to say there is no room for improvement. There are still some homes shown to the right, indicated by the bars to the right of the red vertical line, which have, an, which have a higher EUI than the prescriptive code EUI. So once we have the data for each climate zone within each state, we use it to calculate a statewide EUI distribution and a mean EUI. And in order to do, in order to do that, we use the construction rates for each of the climate zones. So what you see on the screen right now is an overlay of the EUI distribution for Climate Zone 2A and Climate Zone 3A in Alabama. However, these have each of the vertical bars has been weighted using the construction shares for Climate Zone 2A and 3A respectively to come up with a weighted EUI. In other words, what you see on the screen is the data for the full set of 3,000 building models built for Alabama. However, they have been adjusted such that the area under the curve or the sum of your vertical bars is still 100%. We can conclude from, and then the purple line shows uh, the mean UI based on the field data, again, simulated. And what we can see is that on average in the state of Alabama, this, this follows what, is, what we saw for Climate Zone 2A and 3A, that statewide, um, on average, homes built in Alabama are consuming less energy than a home built completely to prescriptive code requirements would uh, consume. There are several homes uh, shown by the blue bars, especially um, to the right of the red um, vertical line, which indicate that some homes indeed consume uh, more energy than, than the prescriptive code EUI. Um, another thing to note here on this chart is that Climate Zone 3A clearly dominates uh, the construction, <clears throat> the construction of new single family homes in Alabama. And I uh, my notes say it, it accounts for 78%. Uh, one more thing uh, that we noticed in, in our analysis was we saw similar trends where uh, the mean EUI based on the field data was lower than uh, the prescriptive code EUI in, in four of the five or five of the six um, states that we have analyzed so far. The only exception to this rule was Maryland, uh, which has recently adopted the 2015 IEPC, which is by far the most stringent code um, in the set of uh, states that we are looking at. The rest of the states are at the 2009 IEPC, and uh, North Carolina uses a slightly amended version of 2009 IEPC. So once we have done this EUI analysis, we want to find out whether there are potential savings to be had from um, from from targeting some of these measures that we've collected data for. Now, the key items or the key drivers for the saving potential 
is uh, firstly the distribution of the observed key items. We use it to create um, energy, mo uh, energy models for the EUI analysis, as well as to identify areas with savings potential. The other important driver is the applicable code requirement. In some cases, we see that some of the code requirements heavily influence the observations for some key items. Uh, and case in point is the frame wall um, distribution that we saw for Alabama. Most homes were right at the R13 requirement, but few homes doing a little better. And um, I don't think we saw any that were doing worse. The applicable code requirements are also used to define the baseline against which we compare the EUI of the, of the observed uh, population. Finally, the distribution of savings by fuel type is also important in estimating energy cost savings as well as the emission reduction potential. It does not directly affect energy. So now that we've conducted the EUI analysis, we use um, the data that we have created and all the data that we have collected to estimate the savings potential. And we use two distinct approaches for different needs to address different needs. The first approach is an overall savings potential approach. What we do here is we review the data from the 1,500 models that we create for each climate zone within, within each state, and we isolate the models that have a total EUI greater than the prescriptive code EUI. What this helps us to do is it helps us to account for the interactions between all the measures, as well as the impact of random sampling, and gives us a very conservative estimate of the savings potential. So this forms our lower bound um, of our savings potential estimate. The second method, which is a completely different uh, distinct approach, is a measured level, a measured level savings potential um, calculation. What we do is we look at the key item observations that we've collected, and we use the, only the worse than code observations for a given measure to conduct new simulations and we isolate the potential energy savings from that specific measure. Now, this ignores the interaction between different building components, and, but it gives us a very optimistic savings estimate. Finally, we use these estimates along with uh, projected annual construction uh, to estimate overall savings at the state level. The real answer actually lies between, like I said before, we calculate these um, the savings potential in, in two different ways, and uh, the overall um, EUI method or the whole building level gives us a more conservative estimate, which forms the lower bound of our estimate, whereas the measure level analysis gives us an optimistic answer that forms our upper bound of the estimate. And the real answer probably lies somewhere between these two. So let's look at um, a sample calculations that we did for the state of North Carolina. Please note that we've switched from Alabama to North Carolina simply because uh, this, this analysis was not completed uh, for the state of Alabama uh, in time. So what we see on the screen is um, the savings potential using the overall EUI or the whole building level approach. And we see there are savings um, of, of up to 27,000 million BTUs a year to be had. Um, almost half a million dollars in energy cost savings and uh, close to 1,150 tons of um, CO2 um, that could be saved. Now let's look at the measure level savings. So we looked at measure level savings, which form um, the upper bound estimate for North Carolina. Um, and we looked at lighting, envelope tightness, and duct leakage. And we looked at these three items separately simply because these were the three items that, uh, based on the data that we collected, had the highest energy savings potential. So we look at each one of these in isolations and we, isolation, and we see that the total energy savings potential is, is much higher. Um, these are not additive because there are interactions between these components. But this forms the, over, uh, the upper bound of our um, savings estimate uh, for North Carolina. So apart from, the the, apart from the results that we just discussed as part of the initial results package, we also looked at um, state We also looked at comparing the collected data across states to identify if, if there were interesting trends um, that, that we could capture. So we looked at um, state comparisons for um, a number of key items that we had collected data for, 
And the next several slides um, discuss these state comparisons and, and some of the um, some of the conclusions we can draw from looking at the distribution of data. So we begin with lighting. <clears throat> the first slide shows the lighting uh, distribution for um, two states, for the state of Kentucky and for the state of Alabama. The x-axis here shows the percentage of high, effic high efficacy lamps uh, observed in a given home. So in this case, a higher number is better because this is the percentage of high efficacy lamps. Uh, the total number of observations for each state is shown by um, the number n at the top right of each panel. And the code requirement of, of the code in effect, in this case, Kentucky and Alabama both have the 2009 IECC. So the red vertical line shows the lighting, um, the high efficacy lighting requirement um, in effect in the state of Kentucky and Alabama. So as you can see, there's a wide range of observations that we collected for, for lighting, that we saw for lighting, um, right from homes, a lot of homes with no high efficacy lighting at all, shown by the vertical bars um, against the zero on the x-axis, right up to homes with a 100% high efficacy lighting in the case, in case of Alabama. So really, there is no specific trend. There's a widespread, a lot of homes are, don't have any high efficacy lighting at all. But let's throw um, another state, and let's look at Texas, uh, the lighting, uh, high efficacy lighting um, data for the state of Texas. Texas, again, has uh, the, two, the 2009 ICC, so it still has the 50% high efficacy lighting requirement. However, there are a lot, there are a lot more homes that have 100% or even between 75% and 100% high efficacy lighting in the state of Texas um, uh, compared, to these, uh, comp compared to Kentucky and Alabama. So we can conclude that lighting is one of those things where we don't see a strong um, trend in the observed data that connects to the code requirement itself. Um, it seems like it's a lot more varied. Next up, we will look at uh, window U factors. And the next several slides in this um, subpart um, show the observed window U factors uh, for each state one at a time. And then we look at uh, the data for all the states to taken together at the end. So what we see on the screen right now is the distribution for the state of Kentucky. The x-axis shows the window U factor. And because this is the window U factor, a smaller value is better. The dotted green line shows the code requirement uh, in effect in the state of Kentucky. So the 2009 ICC requirement for climate zone 4, which is 0.35, um, a U factor of 0.35. And each of these vertical bars show the number of homes um, that, 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 the number of uh, homes um, at each observed U factor level. So as you can see, um, because like I said, because this is U factor and the lower U factor is better, the um, number of homes to the left of the green line are better than code, and the number of homes to the um, and the observations to the right of the green line are worse than code. And as you can see, most of the most observations that we saw for the state of Kentucky uh, were better than or equal to code. If you see the total number of observations uh, at the top right um, of the of the slide, out of the 91 total observations we had, 89 were better than or equal to code for Kentucky. There were only two observations that were worse than code. The next slide shows similar data for the state of Alabama. Alabama has two climate zones, and the 2009 IECC has different um, code uh, different uh, window U factor requirement for climate zone 2A and 3A. But we've color coded these two requirements along with the um, observations to make it uh, make the pairing easy. But the pairing was unnecessary because clearly, out of the 92 total observations we had, all of them were better than or equal to code in the state of Alabama. We saw similar trends for other states as we go along. Pennsylvania, again, there were only three um, that were worse than, three observations were worse than code, uh, 104 better than or equal to code. In Texas, we had all the observations better than code. And, and we, are looking at, we are looking at a good number of observations. We are looking at numbers between um, 70 to 100 odd um, in case of Pennsylvania. So these are 
this is a good number of observations and yet we see um, most of them are better than or equal to code. In Maryland, 132 better than or equal to code. Um, only three are worse than code. And, and in North Carolina, again, all the 160 observations better than or equal to code with nothing doing worse than code. So what if we took all this data, all this window data that we had, and put it on the same axis? So what you see on the screen right now is exactly that. We took the observations for each of these states, and we put it on the same x-axis. So the x-axis um, here is the window U factor. So a lower window U factor is better. So the values as you move to the left of the chart, the values get better and better. The red hash, uh, the red dotted lines are uh, the code requirements um, in in um, in each of these um, in each of these climate zones. As the vertical scatter has just been introduced, these the ob okay. the observed values are grouped by state, and the vertical scatter does not mean anything apart from um, the fact that it has been introduced just to make um, the the observations more visible instead of superimposing the dots on top of each other. But the horizontal spread is the spread in the U factor. And as you can see, across the board, on the north to south, for the states that we have, the window U factors all fall between the 0.25 to a 0.35 range, with some outliers. But for most part, that's, that's, that's where we are seeing um, uh, most of our window U factors um, falling in. We saw a similar trend on the SHGC. Um, again, this is the data for all the states uh, taken together on the same chart. Uh, the vertical spread has just been introduced so that we could see each of the each observation um, uh, clearly instead of superimposing those dots. Uh, and as you can see, um, most of these observed values lie to the left of your dotted red lines, which are the code requirements. And in case of SHGC, it means they are better than what the code requires. So this could mean several things. This could mean that um, windows um, are, are generally, the, ob the windows that we observe in the field are generally better than what the code requires. Or it could also be the influence of programs such as Energy Star. The next item that we found interesting was envelope tightness. And the first chart uh, that you see on the screen shows the observed envelope tightness expressed in air changes per hour at 50 pascals for each of the states. The red dotted line in each case is the code requirement in effect in that state. So in case of Kentucky, Alabama, Pennsylvania, and Texas, which are at the 2009 IEPC, the red dotted line is at seven air changes at 50 pascals. In case of Maryland, which is at the 2015 IEPC, the requirement is more stringent at three air changes uh, at 50 pascals, and North Carolina, which has um, a customized version of the 2009 IECC uses a five air change uh, limit. The number of observations that we have for envelope tightness for each of the states is shown at the top right hand side in each panel that's indicated by the uh, indicated by N. And because this is envelope tightness and the x axis is the ACH50 value, as you move to the left of your um, of the chart the um, values get better. So in, in other words, the observations that lie to the left of the dotted red line are better than code, and the observations that lie to the right of the dotted red line are worse than code. And you can see across the board, um, in, for the states that use the 2009 IUCP and, and even North Carolina, um, for most part, they are doing pretty well. They are meeting the code requirement. And in fact, um, we have we saw several observations that were lower than uh, uh, five air changes in, in in many of these states. So the next, so we decided to take all the data and look at this is a little um, complicated, but what we tried to do is we tried to see what percentage of observations fell in each of these bins. So what you have on the x-axis is uh, the state, one bar per state. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage of, um, of observations that fell in each of the color-coded bars indicated by the interval in the legend. Now, the, the one takeaway from this chart is green and um, blue, um, 
the green and the orange is is better than um, that than what we expect. So what we see is across the board, more than fifty percent um, of of homes uh, actually fall in the less than uh, five air changes, or in some cases less than four air changes um, per hour. Another way of looking at the same data is to look at the data for Maryland and Kentucky, two states with very different code requirements. Uh, Kentucky at the 2009 IECC with the seven air changes requirement shown by the uh, peach dotted line on this chart. And then we have Maryland, which is at the 2015 IECC. And because of where Maryland, <clears throat> Maryland is located, the requirement is three air changes at 50 pascals. And it is shown by the blue dotted line on this chart. And um, the observation, the observed data for Maryland is shown by blue dots, and the observed data for Kentucky is shown by peach dots. And as you can see, even though the code requirement is very different for these two states, the cluster of the dots is more or less in the same location. They're all in the three, um, three to five um, air change um, range. What this means is, um, for, for states that are doing things right, it seems like they're hitting these lower um, air leakage levels regardless of what the code requirement is. Yet another way of looking at the data uh, for, all, for all states is by doing a box plot. Now this box plot is done by climate zone. And on the x-axis we have the climate zone, one box per state, uh, one box per climate zone. And on the y-axis we have the envelope tightness expressed in air changes per hour at 50 pascal. The height of the box is the, is the range of the middle um, half of the observe, observed values in the field. The whiskers or the lines extending out of the box um, indicate that the full range of the observed values. And the outliers are indicated by uh, the black dots, especially in case of uh, climate zone four, we saw some uh, outliers there. But as you can see, across the board now, it, it could have something to do with the fact that most of these states are at the 2009 ICC, uh, with the ex exception of um, North Carolina and Maryland. Um, so we are looking at a seven air change requirement that the code requires. But most, of, but across the board, we saw uh, most of the homes were actually um, in the four to six air change um, uh, air change range, and the median. Uh, for each of these cases is shown by the horizontal line within each box, which, which is lower than five air changes across the board. What this tells us is that things are actually better for air leakage than, than what the code requires. We saw similar things, similar trends for duct leakage. So the next slide shows the duct leakage observations for each of the states. Again, the x-axis is the duct leakage rate um, expressed as CFM at 25 pascals per 100 square foot um, condition floor area. The number of observation in each state is indicated by the N, uh, which is mentioned at the uh, top right hand side within each panel. And the red vertical line is the code requirement that is in effect in that particular state. So again, we have Kentucky, Alabama, Pennsylvania, and Texas at the 2009 ICC. We are looking at a 12 CFM, um, 25 pascals per 100 square foot condition floor area. Uh, Maryland is at 2015 IECC, so we are looking at a 4 CFM um, at 25 pascals per 100 square foot um, limit. And North Carolina has a limit of um, 6 because it uses a custom code. Now, across the board, you can see that regardless of where the red dotted line is, um, the cluster of dots is more or less in the same place. And because we are looking at duct leakage on the x-axis, the observations to the left of your red dotted line are better than uh, the code requirement. And observations to the right of the red dotted line are worse than code. So if you look at um, two states in isolation, if you look at Alabama and North Carolina, um, these two states have very different uh, code requirements. Alabama has um, a limit of uh, duct leakage limit of 12. And North Carolina has a duct leakage limit of 6 CFM at 25 pascals per 100 square foot condition floor area. But as you can see, the observed values all fall um, in, the, in the 3 to 10 uh, CFM um, at 25 pascals per 100 square foot um, range. So clearly, it means that in some places, 
where people are are building these duct systems um, uh, tight, um, the code requirement itself doesn't seem to have much bearing on what we observed in the field. So in summary, oh, I have one more chart. Finally, we have the above grade uh, walls. The, um, we are showing this chart shows only the cavity insulation, and it shows it for every um, state um, using a panel approach. The x-axis here is the wall cavity insulation. And because we are looking at R values, um, higher R values are better. Uh, the dotted lines that we see, uh, which have been color coded, um, show the code requirement that is in effect in that state. It's a little hard to see in some cases, but we've tried to color code them. Um, we, we've tried to match the color between the code requirement and, and the number of homes that fall um, um, within each observed level. Now, across the board, we see that in case of walls, um, most of the observed values are at or better than, um, or are, are better than or equal to what the code requires them to be. In some cases, we have super insulated walls, like um, in case of Texas and in case of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and even Kentucky. Um, we see uh, observations that are actually, we saw several observations that had a higher cavity wall insulation than what the code required. So, in summary, um, these are the kinds of results that that we've uh, that we've been creating and that we will be sharing with the project teams as part of the initial results package. Um, to retrace what we have shown is a very small amount of the data we have available, and we hope that others will use this data to conduct their own analyses. Um, this data will be made publicly available to facilitate the same. And on our end, uh, we will continue to mine the data to see if there are interesting patterns or trends um, that might be helpful in advancing energy efficiency in new residential buildings. That concludes the results section. Uh, back to you, David. OK, thank you, Vrishali. Great job. Uh, I'm just going to go through this real quick because we want to leave time for questions. So as you can imagine, um, there's an awful lot of data. Uh, so far, we only have six of the states that are complete. Uh, there's two more within the original group, and then two more beyond that uh, that are following the methodology. So these are very, very rich data sets. Um, so the conclusions, I just want to emphasize that these are very preliminary conclusions. But I think a couple things are pretty clear. I mean, one is builders and building officials are doing a very good job meeting the adopted codes. Uh, on average, the homes are using less energy than you'd expect based on the prescriptive codes. Um, and in fact, the only state where that wasn't true is Maryland, but Maryland is so much more stringent than the other states, it's still, on an absolute sense, uh, doing better than the other states. It's just relative to its own code. It's a little above uh, what you would expect uh, versus the prescriptive. But I, I think these results are surprising to a lot of people, um, and it, it's impressive how well things are doing overall. Um, that being said, uh, there is still significant savings potential from individual code requirements that do not comply with the code. Uh, Vrushali showed a couple slides where we're showing lots and lots of MMBTUs and dollars available from focusing on certain areas. And what's uh, become clear uh, is that there are certain areas of the code really worth focusing on and others where you just don't have to worry about it. So Windows, for example, I don't know, I didn't count up the dots, but you know, 98, 99% of all the Windows we saw are better than code. There's no need, uh, if you're just talking about compliance, to do an education and training effort to up that uh, because we're getting what we would expect already. Uh, on the other hand, things like lighting are very inconsistent. We've got lots of people doing 100%, uh, even when the requirement is only 50%. And then we have even more without any high efficacy bulbs installed. So that's one we need to work on. Um, 
then there's others where the results seem to be right on the code. The walls are the most obvious one. So clearly the code is driving the results of that. Um, but the good news is there is nothing we've seen so far in these six states where everything is consistently worse than code. So uh, we have similar studies underway, as I said, in Michigan, Arkansas, Georgia, and West Virginia. There will be more data. And the, the big conclusion that I would draw from this is that you really do need to go out in the field. Uh, those studies are critical to understanding the patterns of compliance and their impact on energy. Uh, in you know, in reality, real life on the ground, and hopefully all this data is really moving us forward in understanding that. Okay, uh, along those lines, I want to uh, make you an offer. Um, if you are planning a study, or if you're if you could plan a study, uh, they cost about one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars each. That's what we budgeted, and the budget was okay in, I think, four or five of the six states uh, it worked. So that's, I'm not saying it's a perfect budget, but it's close. You can definitely do it for that. And if you are doing a study, PNNL is available to you for free to help with the samples design, help create customized data collection forms, and they will do the analysis for you. So that takes a lot of the cost off of the states or utilities uh, who want to do these studies. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is single family only. Uh, there is not a commercial methodology available yet. Uh, it's a very different beast. Uh, we are working on it, but it's probably going to be a couple of years until we get there. In terms of what's available for you right now, uh, the spreadsheets containing all the field data that the results were based on that we just showed you, and the webinar presentation slides, if you just go, you can see in blue at the bottom, go to that URL and those are available right now. We are writing up the methodology, uh, both a guideline and a detailed technical support document. Those are coming soon. Each of the states in the study will have a report. Uh, that's coming soon. And then at the end, there will be an overall project report when we've done all three phases. And that won't come for a couple of years, but that'll wrap everything up. All right, uh, if you would like more information, we've got the contacts here, both at DOE and at PNNL. And finally, uh, this is a little off topic, but it's very important to me. There is a National Energy Codes Conference coming March 21 through 24 in Tucson, Arizona. So I want to plug that, and I hope we will see you all there. Uh, the registration site is not open yet, but it will be within a few days. So check www.energycodes.gov soon. With that, uh, we are going to be open to questions. So I'm turning it back to Rose, and she will let us know who's going to answer what questions or what they are. Thanks, David. Yeah, it looks like a lot of questions have come in. So thank you very much to all of you uh, for participating in the webinar today. And it looks like we still have well, close to 25 minutes to answer as many of those questions as we can. And I think we'll go in the order of the presentation. So David, I'm actually going to kick it right back to you uh, for any questions that you can answer on your initial background section? Well, I am very happy to say that there were no questions on the introduction. So back to Jeremy. All right, Jeremy. OK, sure. Yeah, several, several questions um, regarding the methodology. So I'll touch on a few of uh, uh, the questions here. So first of all, we got a question that says, what is a qualifying home? I'm not entirely sure you know, what we mean exactly by qualify, but I'm going to guess that we mean you know, a home that's eligible for inclusion in the sample. So that's essentially any home that's under construction within the, the study area. So the sampling plan is broken down by jurisdiction. So for example, the county, uh, the project team would conduct or contact the local building department, obtain a list of all the active projects. And um, so if a requirement is three sets of key items from a particular jurisdiction, the team would conduct visits until uh, those three sets are obtained. 
another question. How did you determine compliance with installation requirements if only based on observable data? So this kind of plays off the last question a little bit too. So the project teams under the methodology have to continue visiting homes until that sampling plan is fulfilled, meaning they continue their site visits until 63 wall observations, for example, are obtained. Um, and so one thing to remember is that the observations continue for the other items since you're on site anyways, so you are going to end up with more than 63 observations for many of the items. And as you might expect, wall insulation was indeed one of the more difficult observations just because of the timing of the site visit. So there's a small window of time between when the insulation is in place and fully installed and observable and um, not yet covered up by other materials. So I have, there's a, actually we got several questions that are all kind of the same question. So I'm going to lump the questions together and then I'll try and hit all of them at once. So was a blower duct and blower door test done as part of the code requirement? And did all the state's uh, codes have prescriptive infil infiltration and duct testing targets? And does the 2009 IECC actually have an air infiltration requirement? Or is a visual inspect inspection acceptable? And so one thing to keep in mind here is we, or the project teams, performed uh, duct blaster testing and blower door testing um, in all cases. So in some states, it is required by the code, uh, but we conducted the tests regardless. Um, all the states in the study, at least, have you know, the 2009 IECC or better. Um, so there is an air infiltration requirement there in all cases it's just a matter of some of the older editions like the 2009 allow for verification via visual inspection but again we did perform the test in every home and, and that's for things you know just as simple as needing an apples to apples comparison for the eventual data set and uh, if you're going to look at energy in homes you can't ignore things like air leakage they're they're big ones so can the data collection forms be shared the short answer is yes they're on the DOE project uh, web page right now and uh, that URL is in the presentation and feel free to shoot us an email and we'll get you pointed in the right direction. What is, this is also a key question, what are the, what is the fewest number of homes that would have to be visited in order co to collect the required data? So that was a big question at the outset of the study as you can imagine, especially by the project teams. And theoretically, the, and as a reminder, the number is 63, so theoretically if you could observe everything in a single site visit, you can do it in 63 homes, but practically that's obviously not possible. So most, most teams, I would say, had hypothesized about 180 to 200 homes or about a multiplier of about 3x, um, but maybe as few as 2x or even as high as, 5X, as uh, excuse me, 4x, and most studies are coming in pretty close to those, uh, those estimates. Question, did the survey determine what percentage of homes were seeking compliance under the prescriptive path versus performance? Uh, yes, the data collection form that the teams used had a question that, that sought to find out what compliance path was being used and looking for things like, you know, was, was ResCheck used or was there a HERS rating conducted, was it an Energy Star home or some other above code program. Um, so the data set does include some of that information, but keep in mind that those are not key items, so you're not going to have a full data set there. And what I mean by that is, is therefore, they are not statistically significant items. And then... Lastly, there was a question uh, regarding Maryland and observing the fact that the 2015 code went into effect there more recently and um, if homes were grandfathered or how that works. And, and the basic answer is one of the unique aspects of this study is it's not looking at compliance in terms of just yes or no. It's looking at you know, the observations of what was actually installed. So like our values instead of just a simple yes or no. And so we can actually compare that set of observations to different levels, you know, if needed. And so if there's something that happens like a, a state during the course of the study um, goes through an adoption process or updates their code or has a code change, then we can largely account for that in the, in the data set. So I think that is the majority of the questions I have here, unless there are a few trickling in that haven't made it to me yet. And so I will uh, pause and pass it along. Okay, sounds great, Jeremy. Thanks much. We'll, we'll let you have a chance to look to see if you have some, as you said, that trickled in. And we'll switch to Brushali. Do you want to start covering some of your questions? Sure, Rose. Um, so I have a lot of questions on my list, so I'm going to run through them as fast as I can. And there are a few here where, where we might need to um, get back to the person who asked the question. 
so the first square, the first one up is Alabama does not require envelope testing. Um, so the data, I'm assuming, means this is good considering uh, that it was not required. References the data. Um, there is a similar um, uh, thought on Kentucky that does not have a um, envelope testing requirement, and how we can expect them to have uh, seven A changes at 50 pascals or lower. While it is correct that the 2009 IECC offers you uh, two options um, for envelope leakage. One is a blower door testing um, and achieving a 7A change or better uh, result. And the other one is a detailed checklist. Now, because we are trying to, um, uh, because we are trying to tie it all in into an EUI analysis and we need, um, we need specific inputs for our building uh, model, we choose the 7A change option uh, for the envelope testing requirement. The next question is, what was the average number of requirements that were typically able to be observed at each home? Um, I will defer to, um, uh, to, to uh, Mark and some of our other um, data collection experts on that, but um, my impression is that it varied by a large margin. The next question is, is there additional detail on ceiling insulation to explain R values that were below code? Were the, code, were the below code houses insulated with spray foam? Uh, we do have additional detail. We did collect the insulation type um, and, and other uh, surrounding details um, which were used when we QA'd this data to make sure that we were uh, looking at uh, the correct R values and the correct thicknesses and everything. So we did consider all that uh, when we created these um, distributions and, and, and used the um, data in EUI analysis. Then the next, there are a couple questions on trade-offs. So did the R value code requirements take into account trade-offs as computed by RESTCheck? And uh, there's another question that asks how um, a home that's sought compliance via RESTCheck would show up here. The, because this whole data collection effort is based on a single site visit, and, and we also uh, noted earlier in the presentation that <clears throat> we used only the observed values and did not make any assumptions um, uh, regarding any of these other, um, uh, any of these elements. So it's a little hard to capture the impact of trade-offs because of these constraints. Uh, the expectation, however, is that um, if, if a certain kind of trade-off is being used very commonly in the field, it would show up um, in, in the observed data and as a secondary effect would be accounted for. The next question is, what kind of background para parametrics were used for the data sets that come from various parts of the East? Use of energy varies for Alabama and North Carolina and Michigan. So we, we did use um, the observed um, values for the key items, and we used it in conjunction with our uh, single family, with DOE's single family prototype building model. Um, so the observed values that we see, and these, each of these um, models uh, were simulated using weather files and weather data um, specific to the climate zone and state. So that should account for um, the different um, weather patterns that these building C and, and hence the different energy use. The next question, there are a couple questions on uh, whether we, we will be studying the actual energy consumption and to determine the accuracy of the EUI uh, modeling. And I will defer to David on that as, and, and let him cover that. But as far as I know, um, no, that is not something that is planned uh, in the immediate future. The next question is, uh, EUI is sensitive to percentage of fenestration, but you didn't see that in the methodology. Was that measured or just assumed to be 15%? So we used the DOE single family uh, residential building prototype to set all the geometric um, um, properties of the building. That includes fenestration. And yes, it is said to be 15% of the window. Uh, it is said to be 15% uh, of the floor area. Um, and this approach allows us to sort of isolate the impact of, of the code requirements and, and not get into the thermal impacts of more or less windows. The next question is on the efficiency of mechanical equipment, uh, whether uh, that was uh, mechanical e equipment equivalent in the as-built models and the prescriptive code models in order to isolate the impact. We used um, the federal minimum um, equipment efficiencies across the board. so. Um, that is that was that is not something that is directly governed by the code and and because we are looking at the impact of the code, we maintain those at the federal minimum levels. 
The next question is, did you take into account the loss of heat, the loss of heat gain from high efficiency lighting, which would otherwise contribute to the heating of the home? Um, well, heating a home with lighting is not most efficient, but yes, we did account for um, the loss of heat gain from high efficacy lighting. Um, how do results so far compare to what has been predicted? And what is the overall cost effectiveness? Um, we did look at, um, we did compare the EUIs that we got from simulating the observed values in the field with the prescriptive code minimums, and we showed you the results for Alabama. Uh, we have not conducted any cost effectiveness analyses on, on any of this so far. Question, do we get to have a full report with all observations in each state? Yes, the answer is yes, and Rose my, will correct me if I if I'm wrong on that. Question, slide number 40. The number of times the number of homes don't seem to add to the end. Why is that? Please explain. So I looked at that slide and it seems like the y-axis um, is a little um, messed up, but that does not change the conclusion of the slide, which is that most of these observed values were better than or equal to code. Next question, could some of the observations that were not in good range be due to the fact that the home was built to a previous state code? Um, these homes were selected for um, for sampling. The homes that were selected for sampling took into consideration uh, the code that was into effect. So, no, that that's not the reason why these homes are not in a good range. Please, the next question. Please talk about um, the Monte Carlo method. Was there an attempt to determine the likelihood that any two or more observed characteristics would happen simultaneously in a home? Now, because this this whole analysis and the whole design experiment is based on a single site visit principle, uh, we don't have enough data to determine the likelihood of uh, two or more characteristics occurring simultaneously in a house. So each of these data sets was considered separately, um, independently, uh, was assumed to be independent when we did the Monte Carlo random sampling. We did use bootstrapping at the uh, other end to make sure that um, everything was proportional to that effect. Next question, of the homes that did not meet the code, what was the total missed KBTU savings and missed um, CO2 savings? So we did look at that in a couple of slides where we looked at the overall EUI approach and we looked at the measured level savings approach where we tried to see uh, what kind of potential savings uh, were still left. Um, and, and you will find some of the data there. Um, we went over the calculations for the state of North Carolina, but we are in the process of conducting um, that analysis for the other states as well. Next question. Were field observations compared to or informed by the expected efficiency levels as found on plans or other energy calcs helped by, held by local building departments? So we used only the observed, the actually observed values. We did not assume anything, nor did we go back to plans um, to collect any data. It was all, um, all these observations were actually observed, seen in the in the building, in the field. Next question. Were the energy savings projected to the total number of houses likely to be built in a state and time frame? Please explain. Uh, yes, we did use the potential energy savings um, uh, in conjunction with the construction starts expected uh, in the state um, over a period of a year and then five years and so on to calculate the potential energy savings. Um, question, how many homes were built in each state during the data collection? Very difficult to say um, if it's, um, yeah, I, I don't think I can answer that question. It's very difficult to say. And finally, were the home screen for participation in above efficiency, above, uh, in energy efficiency programs? Uh, yes, the checklist did have an item asking if the program, um, if the home uh, used any of the above code programs. I have one more uh, question that just came in. Uh, heat loss is the most critical at the roof. Why is only ceiling listed? Uh, this is because the residential prototype building um, that we used for energy modeling assumes um, ceiling insulation. So the uh, insulation is placed uh, on, on the thermal boundary between the attic and, and the living space. So that's why we used only the ceiling insulation and not roof deck insulation. Uh, there are three more. Rose, do I have a couple of minutes to go through these? They just came in. Uh, Rushali, why don't we give your voice a break for just a minute? Jeremy, do you have Sorry. any others to cover? 
it looks, Jeremy? I think we've covered all of all of the ones that came to me here. I glanced back through and some of them were duplicates and so I would say the methodology questions are covered. Okay, super. David, anything um, on your end? Yeah, there, there's a few. So a couple people asked questions about the applicability of the methodology to existing homes or our intention of doing studies on existing homes. And I, I guess my immediate thought is it's not applicable. Uh, the entire methodology was wrapped around code. So while you could go out and look at existing homes and whether they met the current code, I'm not sure that would tell you anything since they weren't expected to meet that code. Um, that being said, as I mentioned earlier, we are hoping to develop a methodology for commercial and ideally we would develop one for multifamily also, but that would be all new construction. Uh, do you have any plans to use this method in a mild climate like California? The, the budget does not allow us at this point to do any more states. However, as I mentioned, the methodology is available to anyone and we are certainly, certainly hoping that lots of other states in all of the other climate zones will apply this methodology, can use PNL services. Ideally, I'd love to see a data set that has all 50 states in it. It would be unbelievable. Um, let's see this question. Are there plans to create? Are there plans to create a compliance methodology that use these field results to create a scoring system that is calibrated to the to reflect the relative importance of these measures? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand that question. So we started with an analysis to identify the measures that were most impactful. That's those key elements that Jeremy showed in the methodology section. Um, I, I think what's in here somewhere is, are we now going to sort of reverse engineer it? And I, I can only say I'm not sure. Uh, that's something we'll need to look at. Uh, see, we're, we're planning to doing lots of analyses on the data, so we'll see what we come up with there. Um, how much were the builders paid? Uh, they were not paid anything. Uh, this was very uh, labor intensive on the part of the teams, but the homes were identified, people were contacted, and then the contractors went on site. Uh, there was no incentive paid. And the last, well, I got the hard questions. How does negative, how do you see? There was, it's a question about how this data might reflect positively or negatively on the energy ratings index path that is in the 2015 code. Uh, it says, it seems if builders are willing to exceed code at these levels, it bodes well for more stringent performance-based approaches like the HERS index alternative. Um, I, you know, that may be true. I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, but what I am happy to say is I believe this data that's being provided will allow lots of other organizations to do analyses for all sorts of different reasons. Um, so that's all of the questions. I'll double check. Yeah, that's all the questions I got. Rose. Okay, thanks much, David. Rushali, we have time for uh, you to cover two more questions before we end. Okay, so one of the questions is, did you consider infrared analyses of homes? Um, the answer is no, we did not. Um, and finally, are the simulations done on each home based on a single prototype wearing the measures as observed, or is there a simulation run on each home with a combination of measures observed or inferred from the Monte Carlo methodology? Um, it's the latter. The simulation is run on each home with a combination of measures inferred from the Monte Carlo methodology. Wow, that was a great job getting through all those questions. Thanks very much. We'd like to thank everyone for attending as well. We really appreciate your time and hope you found the webinar uh, interesting. The U.S. Department of Energy wants to thank everybody, and this concludes the webinar.